interesting. All right. Yeah, did they fail to take it into account, or did they actually weigh up the cost benefits and reckon it was a good deal? <laughs> good question. All right. Um, I want to talk about transition engineering because that's actually what I'm doing. I, I, I've been working on renewable energy and sustainable energy for, for ages, and I think we need to actually step up the game. We need to figure out um, what we're going to do that's actually going to change things, change that sort of thing. Um, I was asked to talk about how do we balance our needs with those of future generations. And a lot of you should know sort of where that comes from. That's the Brundtland Commission um, Statement of Sustainable Development. And, um, you know, for a lot of years, a lot of years, evolution of ethics, there's, surely we have, we have evolved in our ethics. I mean, if you go back to the classical Greek culture, women were not considered to have a soul. For a long time, the Catholic Church thought that too. Um, you know, certainly when we move into a new space, uh, indigenous people, you know, they're treated quite poorly. And even our own people, if you think about the Magna Carta in England, that was, that was kind of a big change in who was going to be included in what kind of rights you're going to have, how you had to be treated, how you're going to be uh, protected under the law. So abolition of slavery, that's got to be a positive step in evolution. We got better. We started including people who had a different color in people who were going to be covered by the law and, and were going to have protections. Women getting to vote, public education. You know, there was a time when, when you only got to be educated if your parents paid for it. Um, child labor laws, civil rights, disability access, fair trade. We're coming along, aren't we? Aren't we getting better? It's looking pretty good. So can we extend that to future generations? Can we? And I, I've thought that for a long time. Can't we see future generations as people who actually need protection? as people who have rights, as people who we are now going to include in um, you know, rights and responsibilities, just like we have, right? If we do wrong to people of the future, then we can be held accountable, that sort of thing, that idea that just, just remember how, how um, impossible it would have seemed to include uh, you know, uh, African people brought over as slaves to America in that body of people who have the right to be free and do what they want to do. Is that it? Is that the evolution we're going to make? That we're going to start including future generations? Is that how we're going to do it? And my answer to that is, uh, it's too late for that. Good idea. I would love to go with that, but it's too late. In order to do that evolution, in order to move on and get better, we have to have people who are willing to put it on the line for those people. You talk about abolitionists in the USA, the people who got rid of slavery. They were attacked. They were run out of town. They had a very hard job to do. Civil rights, same thing. Women's suffrage, same thing. Nobody ever gives anybody anything. You have to get it. Who is out there championing future generations? Who is standing up for them? Who is writing the laws that protect them? Right? It's missing. We're not going to make it. That's not going to happen. All right, too late for that. We have changed, definitely. We've uh, moved right along. And mostly what we've done, that future generation people are wishing we hadn't done, is do a lot of good work at getting uh, coal, oil, and gas out of the ground and putting it in the air. They're kind of wishing we hadn't done that. All of the benefits that we accrued from doing that, just like the benefits the slave owners got from holding slaves, is not going to them, all right? So they've, they, you know, they're stuck with what we've done. And right now, I think they're really hoping we don't do any more of it. <laughs> they're hoping that we change. We change a lot. The other reason I say it's too late is because this whole discussion of future generations is moot. It's not future generations anymore, it's us. All right, we already did it. So that discussion's too late. The boom is over. The best time is here. Future generations, um, you know, the time to think about them was last generation because uh, that would have been, now here we are, this is where we are now. Um, this is a uh, meta analysis of uh, petroleum, petroleum geology. And oil is what gets gold out of the ground, oil is what gets everything done. So oil is the bottom line. 
And I've put a green line there to show you when I was born. Not even one generation. Hopefully about half a generation. I'd like to go on for about another half there. It, you know, in one generation, we have done something that all future generations are going to have to deal with. Right? So it's already played out. Now what's left? What are we going to do? I would love to have that ethical, ethical argument, but I think it's too late. Oh, but what about renewables and nuclear? Right? Isn't that what we can do? That's our, our way to say to future generations, look, we're, you know, we're going to be good now. We, we did that, but now, now we're going to be good. We're going to get renewables, we're going to get nuclear, but fine. But the problem is that future generations, it's not, their problem is not that we didn't use enough wind. Their problem is not that we didn't make enough solar panels. Their problem is that we use too much coal, oil, and gas. And I don't know, I have not seen the evidence, I cannot figure out that us going whole hog into solar panels and wind turbines has reduced our coal, oil, and gas use. The evidence is it hasn't. Right? And there's something called energy return on energy investment, which you can understand why it hasn't. So, future generations, they are already committed to 90% less energy than we use. They are already committed to extreme climate. It's the truth. They are already committed that being basically my grandkids. <laughs> we're not talking 20 generations in the future. We're talking post us. Committed to using an extremely less amount of, of fuel than we do. So the best we can do at all is to invest everything we've got now in systems that work using 90% less fuel. You get that? Everything we build now, it's got to work using less. Because that's what we're going to bequeath to the future. We've already done what we've done. We're going to run that out. So everything we build now, if it works without oil, it's the right thing to do. If it requires more oil, it's the wrong thing to do. What does that look like then? Seems simple enough, right? Well, fundamentals um, is where we need to start. And fundamentals are not that we need to use a lot of energy. A lot of you uh, have experience with other cultures. You know that their happiness is not derived from the toys they play with, you know, from, from, from the gadgets that they use, from the vast amount of resources and energy they use. Human happiness is not derived from that. It's derived from everything else. It's derived from the fact that we get together at night, we nest, <laughs> we get together, we sleep in a safe place with our, with our fun hour. We take care of each other, we take care of our place, and then we go out. We go out to, to do things for other people, to interact with other people, to produce things, to work the land, to gather food. We go out and then we come back. That's humanity. That's our life. That's what we do. That's not going to change. If that's working, it doesn't matter whether you're trading in drachmas or dollars. It doesn't matter whether you're using 300 liters of water a day or 20. As long as you have what you need and your system is working, we've got to get over ourselves and our need for energy. That's not the point. Because the resources we've got to develop now are funny. They're funny things. Their adaptability, that's a resource. We've got it, but we've got to adapt it. I mean, we've got to develop it. What's weird is that we've damped it down. What's funny is that oil drowns these things. You wipe out these resources when you substitute oil for them. It isn't renewable energy we need to substitute. It's the profligate use of energy needs to be substituted with resourcefulness. All right. <coughs> I mean, but again, those of you who've, who've been around other cultures, who understand other places and other ways that people live, and those of you who love history and archaeology and anthropology, understand that that is us. We figure out how to make it work wherever we are with whatever we've got. So we've had a funny run for you know, 70 years or so where we've convinced ourselves that we're oil man, 
Well, we're going to do better than that. We've got to transition. We've got to change, and we have no choice about that, in fact. So we're going to have to do it. How we do it is not looking for more resources. It's to be resourceful. You like that thing, Okay. <laughs> How we're going to do it, here's a methodology. All right, transition engineering. What? What is that about? It's a nice diagram. It's got pretty colors. <laughs> but I tell you what, I've used this for an awful lot of projects that seem impossible. Anybody here mechanical engineers? Well, good. Thermodynamics is impossible too, isn't it? <laughs> There's a lot of things that just seem impossible until you sit down and you start working methodically through it and you apply things that make, you know, things that, that, uh, that are true. You apply laws and you apply fundamentals. That's what this is. I've got complex systems that are the way they are and they need to change. They have humans in them. They have economics in them. They have all these complexities, and I need a method to sit down and start making some sense of this. So this is the method. You start off learning your history. Go back and learn your history. Who are these people? What are they doing here? How long have they been here? Okay, so they've had an exponential growth curve. Why? What happened? What did they find? What was brought in? What new thing happened? You have to understand history. And then, of course, you have to understand now. What's going on? What's happening? What are the pressures? What are the events? And then we start to look forward. There's ways to look forward. One is to just drop a line. Go, okay, well, if you keep going forward, and that's very informative, because what you will then do is you will define your unsustainability. Because <laughs> that's what we do, pretty much. That's us. Right? Is there anything to do that's sustainable? No. Nah. So, but what you'll do is you'll get that gauge of unsustainability. So now you know the scope of the work. Next thing you have to do is you have to understand what the forward operating environment is. Forward operating environment. Women are good at this, in case you wanted to know. Why are women good at it? Because throughout all of history, there's been somebody who's gone out hunting and fighting and you know, turning on and knocking things down and chopping and building, and that's the guy. And then, there's the people whose job it was to take all the stuff in from the harvest, make sure it's preserved, make sure it's dried, make sure it's safe from rats, dry it, smoke it, you know, pickle it, make it into cheese, preserve it for winter. Because we're going to have a long period of time when you go out hunting all you want, but it's going to be the larder we're going to have to eat, right? So we pack it away, we make sure it's safe, and then we have to figure out how to use it over those long months until the sun comes back and we have food again. And that's the forward operating environment. What have you got and how long does it have to last? Okay? So we can look at any kind of resource and we look at the ones that are critical to whoever you are, wherever you are now, whatever you're doing. For us, the easiest one that we really need to look at is oil. Because <laughs> that's what's brought in our world, right? So we can look at the forward operating environment for oil. We can also look at it for climate. How much uh, more carbon can we afford to chuck into the air? Answer, none? All right, down we go then. <laughs> All right, so now we've landed somewhere where we don't know what this is, admittedly. Right? How many of us like to sit around and think about the world without oil? OK, there's some. They're called doomers mostly, right? <laughs> Armageddon, it's going to be bad. Zombies will come. Yeah, it's not a pretty place. Don't want to go there. <laughs> oh, maybe it's not so bad. And if you work in that space, you find out actually it's not bad at all. You just need to look at it. You need to figure out how it would work. Now, it's concepts, because we're not building it right now. We've got to backcast to today and see, well, how, I, how different is that for today, then? What is it that's different about it? New Zealand, I'll give you a clue. That place has got trains. <laughs> The difference between a third world backwater country and a good country without oil is trains. Better get, better get a handle on that. All right, so you back cast then and you see, all right, well, compared to what could be and what is now, where, where are we going to go? What are we going to do? And guess what? You got to trigger. You got to have something that knocks you off your, knocks you off your, gets you moving on something. Maybe it's an earthquake. <laughs> Maybe it's an oil shock. Maybe it's somebody creative saying, hey, dude, look at this. 
That would be cool. And then people go, oh, well, why don't we do that then? All right, you've got to plan for that, and then you've got to start doing change. And that's all sorts of things. There isn't any one thing that does anything. It's all moving together. But it's all now going in a new direction. That's anthropogenic system dynamics. That's how humans move. All right? So that's all there in, in um, what do you call it, in theory and principle. Um, change starts now. Ready? Well, I went and did a project for Ropeu District. Um, it's an engineering within borders. Hope you don't mind that. <laughs> Poor old Brewer District, who drew the lines here? They don't get Taupo, they don't get a port, they don't get a river. They got the one fourth of a mountain. <laughs> it's like, jeez, what was that about? This poor little district, what, 10,000 people or something, you get out of it. Okay, they got carrots. Got it. Yeah. Fine. <laughs> but if you look at the statistics for Rural Bay District, you're just like gonna sit down and cry. <laughs> I don't know what you people can do. I I don't know. You know, they're like, would you come and work with us? Because we've got all these education problems and housing and employment and social problems and health problems. <laughs> and essentially, Rubin District is a little economy that is so out of sync with the rest of New Zealand. That's what it is. They're they're stuck in an economy, surrounded by an economy that is so out of sync with them. It's just not like that. So uh, the challenge is, yeah, um, housing was one of the hugest ones. But when I went there, and I spent a week with Stacy Randall, and we went around and we talked until uh, we were hoarse. We talked to so many people around uh, the Ropeo district. And what we found out was at the root of really what was holding people back from doing anything useful at all. Anybody here from Ropeo district? Didn't think so. <laughs> it was Rodney Oakuni. What? You've only got 10,000 people in your whole district. You've only got two towns of any size, and you all hate each other. <laughs> you would explain this. So we had to do a historical exercise. Okay, yep, there's a reason. It, you know, Rodney used to be a, um, a a prosperous town surrounded by farms, then industrial farming came in, wiped out all the family farms, and then Oakuni used to be a poor little backwater, just the pit stop on the rail, but now they got a ski town, and so there's rich people over there, and so, yeah, they hate each other, and the historical reasons why. And then we've got this weird problem of the army base, there's an army base, which doesn't really add much to the community, but um, what they're doing is they're dumping old army houses for holiday houses uh, into this district, um, and they're uninsulated, and so they drive the power demand up crazy, and um, and they're they're uh, really hurting uh, the, the housing market. And then having seasonal work. Any of you from a district with lots of tourism, where seasonal work? Okay, great, you got seasonal work, but you got seasonal work. It sucks. <laughs> you know, you work for a few months, and then you got no money. <laughs> It's really hard to run a society on seasonal work. Um, the, the high school is really struggling, partly because there's one high school for the two cities, and they hate each other, and because there's no reason to go to school. Just want to hang out, girl. Yeah. Oh, it's really hard. And then, weirdest thing, you know that little landlord? Okay. Well, the way that the government set up the line system was that that half, the half that Okuni's in is stranded on the back end of one line in the power grid. And the only way in there, um, you know, if there's only one line, then there's a monopoly. There's only one company you can buy power from. And they're having to supply these crazy loads produced by the uninsulated houses and all the tourism in the middle of the winter when it's coldest and all the people are there. And so they had to really beef up the line, which cost them a bazillion dollars, but there's only 2,000 people on the line. So like, do you want to have any idea what their power costs in this one little corner of New Zealand? It's unbelievable. It's like 10 times worse than Stewart Island. <coughs> so they really wanted to know about solar power and wind power. What can we do about this? Well, the answer you can do about that is talk to the government now and sort it out. It's just stupid, right? <laughs> no, no amount of solar in the middle of winter is going to fix that. You, you just got to fix the stupid system. Right. So we did this project and we, and we talked to everybody and we, we brainstormed and we thought, what the heck? Because if you're going to do something, if you're going to have a, um, 
a trigger and you're going to do a project that then follows on and changes everything after that. You got to you got to design it pretty good. So what we did was we came up with a, a housing project. Okay, at the school you um, you could have a, a, a course where you design a house freelance. You get to design a house. One of the things that was dragging people down was old houses built in the podcast style. And they weren't right. They weren't facing the right direction. They didn't have the right roof slope. They didn't have the right shape. They weren't in a good relation to the community. It's not right. And you feel yucky when it's not right. So design and build your own house and make it out of what? Well, you do have logs. <laughs> make it out of logs. Turns out there's a guy in Okuni who, who knows all about log houses. He's, he, I mean, he's like an expert at it. And he's willing, after we talked to him, he, he was willing, if the council would allow it, yada, 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 to help the students learn how to build a house. Let's do a project. Let's build one. Let's design it as Rodney House. Like, like you know, uh, not, no, sorry, not a Rangi House. Uh, not, not too Rangi, not right. Um, and let's, you know, let's reflect our own culture in it. And they've got a guy named Che Wilson who's like such a driver for anything to happen. They could actually get this done. So we presented it to him. And you're like, oh gosh, we can do that. That's a good idea. It'd be the high school. Everybody go. And just, okay. <laughs> Let's do it then. And what about this seasonal work? What about what's happened there? Okay, Okuni is getting, getting winter work from tourism. But poor Wadi's history. You know, it's like dead, dead zone over there. Well, cycling. They got a new national cycleway in there. What about cycling? Um, cycling out on the plains is a thing that there's a whole sector that likes to do that, and they were missing that. So they got the mountain bike cycling, but they could also develop the road cycling. You know, guys with beer guts and often they put on spandex on the weekend, those guys. <laughs> and they'll pay a lot to do it, too. It's weird. I don't know, but they could do that. And so they thought about that, and the local vendors, like, oh, yeah, we could do that. We could have a cycling event or two. And then local production, they've got these volcanic soils. How cool is that? and grow carrots that are so good, and yet, it doesn't really help anybody, because it's, it's uh, uh, exit landlords, you know, actually sort of doing it, taking it away, and every once in a while, they want to pull the kids out of school to go collect up the carrots from the fields. <laughs> right, so the New World said, well, okay, we could do a farmer's market, you know, and as long as you keep that train connection, um, I think it'll all work out. So they had ideas about about um, how they could maybe get back some of the local growing that they used to do. Um, and that's about all I've got. That's my, my group from, from last year. And if you're interested in how transition engineering works, you can go to our website and have a look. Um, purchase a textbook that has how to do transition engineering in it that, um, that uh, I wrote. It's been published by CRC. Um, and just give it a try yourself sort of helps to have that, that layout of, of how you go about thinking about a project and, and see what you can come up with for what to start on. Trigger projects, that's what we're looking for. Got to do the concept, got to do, got to know what you're talking about, but we're looking for those things that are, they're little projects, but they start a change in a different direction. 